I'm so glad you decided to join us. I'm John Corcoran, Executive Director of the American Rose Society. We have a very exciting program, Integrated Pest Management of Rose Pests and Diseases by our very own Baldo Viagas. And I hope I always say that right because my last name would be Corcoran. It's always twisted around. But Baldo, we're so glad to have you here today. And we have a lot of other programs coming up uh, that will be for the Consulting Rosarian, along with ones every single month. So always keep that inbox open, looking for our programs that are provided by the American Rose Society and our volunteers. Kim? No, okay. Gary. Gary, I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> yeah. uh, oh that's you. right. Gary Chin here, um, pres uh, president of the Sierra Foot and Rose Society. I'd like to welcome everybody. Today we have a wonderful program titled Insects and Diseases. Integrated Pest Management by Mr. Baldo Viegas. Uh, once the program is complete, we will go into a 30 minute question and answer session. The question and answer process will be a little different than past seminars. We would like to have as many questions answered as possible within the 30 minutes. If you are a consulting Rosarian candidate and you have a question during the seminar, please type candidate prior to posting your question for example, candidate slash what is good ghost spotting. And if you're not a candidate, please do not post candidate prior to your question. Just simply post your question. I will then ask the presenter your question for you. If your question is not answered within 30 minutes, you will receive an email response to your question. Also, very important, if you're watching this seminar with somebody else, please post in the chat bot who you are watching with even if you logged on with both names post it in the chat we want to make sure we have noted your attendance properly and now jerry well good morning good afternoon depending on where you are but i want to tell you how excited i am to introduce baldo he was our go-to guy for questions across the country when um, Dave and I were National CR co-chairs, and he continues to be such a huge help for our new uh, people that took over. Anita and Mike have been able to get Baldo to be speaker for this program, and we're just tickled. And now, if you don't know Baldo, you need to realize that he grows about 1,500 roses of all types, as well as fruit trees and grapevines and blueberry plants. But because he worked in his buggy business as an entomologist for so many years, he knows a wealth of information about insects and diseases. I could list everything. We'd be here all afternoon doing awards and recognitions, but his most recent award was his gold medal from the ARS for many, many years of information, knowledge, and contributions to roses. So a belated congratulations, Baldo. I didn't get to congratulate you in person. Thank you. I'm not going to belabor this with all of the other things he does, because if you're around at roses at all for five or ten minutes you're going to hear Baldo's name come up and if you have the opportunity to be at one of his seminars take it you will enjoy it it's interesting and he presents it in a way that makes it fun so from us to you Baldo thanks for being our buggy buddy for all these years and I'm going to turn the program over to you Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Jerry um, and David. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, integrated pest management. It's a um, it's a huge uh, uh, program. Uh, generally, uh, the various uh, uh, sections of this pr uh, program that I'm giving is uh, would be about a uh, one hour program, but um, uh, generally it takes me about three hours to go through it. Uh, I got to try to do it in one hour. So hold on and uh, um, uh, stay tight in your seat and I'll go through a lot of my slides and um, kind of uh, summarize um, 
what we're going to be talking about. Um, uh, first of all, integrated pest management is an environmental sound integration of all control methods uh, to control a pest population below economic and damaging thresholds. In other words, um, what does that mean? <laughs> Means that um, uh, you try uh, all of the uh, uh, methods that are uh, available, and you keep and you try to keep the pest the pest population that you're interested in controlling below a level that you can live with, or you have to be tolerant. Now, if you notice that the um, uh, this definition is in red. And uh, uh, those that are taking the test or are consulting Rosarians that are taking the test um, uh, need to know this because you might see them in the test. Um, in IPM, uh, that's a short for integrated pest management, and uh, you know that's what I'm going to refer to. Um, we talk about um, uh, several strategies. We talk about prevention and quarantines. Uh, we don't want things to come in from other states or uh, we try to prevent things from happening. Uh, we, we try to um, uh, know the pest and the symptoms of pest. Uh, every pest has a symptom. Um, we try to do monitoring of the pests and diseases. And um, uh, uh, Again, for every pest, uh, they their symptoms that you can monitor for. Uh, some of them, some pests are regular. They always come in at certain uh, times of the year when the environmental conditions are co just correct. And then, of course, um, we talk to uh, about establishing uh, thresholds or guidelines for controlling the pest. In other words, you have to be tolerant. Um, if you um, if you're an, a rose exhibitor. You don't want any damage on your roses, so your threshold is zero. Whereas um, uh, other people, you know, they're very uh, tolerant of the of the uh, damage that you they see in their roses because they don't want to spray. Okay, um, and then of course this this methods in that we use in in um, IPM, uh, we depend a lot on cultural methods. Uh, I practice a lot of physical, uh, mechanical methods in my in my uh, garden, and I'll show you some of the ones that I use. Um, you know, we we always talk about biological control. Well, I worked in biological control for 40 years, so I'll show you some, you know, what biocontrol is all about. And then, of course, uh, we we talk about chemical control or the use of pesticides. Now, Don Swanson is going to talk about um, chemical control and pesticide safety. So I'm not going to go into that because I'm going to let him cover the subject. Um, in cultural controls, and again, there's, uh, there's several questions uh, in the CR test on cultural controls. We talk about growing healthy plants, uh, buying pest-free plants, mater plant materials, uh, choosing resistant varieties uh, if they're available, uh, I open my garden all the time because I I uh, buy all the new roses uh, in the market and then I grow me my garden and then when I have people here I show them that uh, you know how some of these roses grow and then I direct them to uh, roses that are resistant to uh, rose diseases such as uh, black spot or powdery mildew. And of course, um, we talk about um, the planting site. The planting site is very, very important. Um, fertilization, how much how, how or too little. Uh, Brenda talked about fertilization last month. Um, and then we talk about sanitation. Now, this is very, very important. Um, sanitation involves the uh, removing infected plant materials as soon as you see them. Don't wait. Uh, don't wait until um, it becomes a big problem. Uh, if you see uh, um, uh, something out of the ordinary, take a sample and have somebody like me look at it, and then we can give you a recommendation as to what to do. And then, of course, watering methods, uh, too much, too little. Um, in mechanical control, we're talking about the physical uh, killing of uh, the organisms. 
uh, we talk about barriers. Um, we use copper banding for snails and slugs. Um, mulching, you know, a big layer of mulch uh, controls weeds um, and then conserves water. Solarization of the soil. Uh, we use it for controlling weeds um, uh, and soil-borne diseases. Um, we use water for hosing and syringing. Uh, that's for uh, um, controlling aphids and spider mites. Um, hand picking and crushing that's my favorite method um i like i'm a squisher so i like to squish insects whenever i see them um uh, so i'll show you a few things that i've done in the past um hoeing um that's when you use a hoe and then you get rid of the weeds that way and then of course trapping by using pheromones and sticky traps and, and etc in biological control we talk about the uh, parasitic insects, we call them parasitoids because they're not really parasitic. They're very specialized predators that, that end up killing the host. And, um, you know, like a, para, uh, a flea is an, is an example of a parasite because it never kills the host. But in uh, biological control, parasitoids always kill the host. Um, we talk about predators, and uh, there's a huge number of predators out there in our gardens, the lady beetles, lacewings, predatory mites, uh, and so on. I'll show you a few. Uh, we talk about diseases. Um, there are fungal diseases, bacterial, viral diseases. In my, in my work for 40 years, I worked with all of this, um, all, of, all of these diseases for the control of insects, and uh, we test. Um, one example of, um, of a, um, a disease that is used for biological control would be the milk spore for Japanese beetle control. Um, you know, I always ask people, you know, what, is, what makes a good biological control? A good biological control uh, is one that has a very narrow range of hosts, uh, you know, that it, hosts it, that it eats, highly specific. They're good searchers. In other words, they go in there, you know, between the petals of roses and they look for the pest. Um, they just don't sit pretty on the flower and wait for pests to come in. Um, any, any guesses as to what I'm talking about? Anyway, um, and then of course, a good biocontrol is able to keep the, host, uh, the pest population under acceptable levels. And again, I worked on this uh, area for 40 years, so I'm, suppo I'm supposed to be an expert on, on biological control. Now, I'm going to show you some, um, some insects um, that are beneficials. In other words, they're not your enemies. They're not considered biological controls because they're, they have a, a little bit high, wider host range than we usually, uh, we usually want in, in a biologic control agent. This is an example of uh, my new pirate buds. Um, they're very, very tiny. They're about one eighth of an inch um, big. There, you find them between the flower, between the petals of the flowers, uh, feeding on thrips, um, aphids, uh, soft-bodied insects. They're great um, guys to be out there feeding on um, on the pest of the roses. Uh, green lace wings. Um, you can actually buy some of these things, um, but I prefer to um to um uh, uh keep them in my garden without having to buy them and what by and what i do is i i i try not to use pet insecticides as much as possible if i use them i only use them in in the area where i have the problem and then that's it um anyway um the lace wings lay their eggs on the on, in the areas where there's a pest, but, uh, pest uh, going on, you know, such aphids, and you can see on this slide on the uh, left hand side, you can see the uh, the strands uh, with uh, the eggs on the uh, the end of the um, of, of the hairs, and then on the right you can see the larvae with huge mandibles uh, feeding on an aphid. And in my garden, I depend on this guy right here. This is a soldier beetle also called a leather wing beetle. Um, they're found, they're, there's a whole bunch of species, um, many hundreds of species of uh, soldier beetles across the country, and they help in, in, in the control of uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of insects. They're predators. 
And then, of course, everybody talks about the uh, lady beetles, not ladybugs, lady beetles. Okay, there's, all, uh, there's like 20,000 species of lady beetles out there. In my garden, I see as many as five different species very commonly. And uh, again, I never buy any of these lady beetles because I, I find that um, by not using so many pesticides, I can, I can keep a lot of these beetles uh, in my garden taking care of the pest. Um, and then of course, there's a, um, this, uh, a specialized beetle called the uh, Silobora uh, beetle that feeds on uh, um, powdery mildew spores. So uh, lady beetles are an amazing group. Um, they not only feed on insects, but some species feed on uh, fungi. And then of course, um, you know, when everybody asks me um, uh, something about beneficial insects, the number, when the top three insects that they tell me are the praying mantises. Prey mantises, just, they just sit pretty on a flower, but they're not active searchers. They're not good by, uh, they're far removed from bio, being a biocontrol agent. Um, I don't consider them a good beneficial insect because every time I see them, they're feeding on a beneficial insect like a bee or a, or a surface fly. So I don't recommend them. So uh, I don't want to hear any, anybody talking about uh, prey mantis as being a beneficial insect. Then of course, there's a lot of crab spiders out there. A lot of different spiders, not just crab spiders. Um, this is um, a little a crab spider that I see between the petals of the roses, uh, but the jumping spiders are very, very common. Um, the green lane spiders are also common uh, in uh, certain situations, and we use them for um, for controlling some pests. Now, this um, I like to uh, see a, a, a backyards with a lot of different different uh, plants in the garden, not just roses. You can see this is my backyard, and you can see that I planted. Um, uh, single petal roses all around the uh, some of these garden areas and then in the middle I put a lot of different type of plants that are known to be um, uh, good for attracting beneficial insects and um, this uh, this is Yarrow uh, this is Amy Bisnaga um, and these are fantastic um, uh, plants that attract beneficial insects so I I, I plant them uh, whenever I can to attract the beneficial insects to keep up pest population under control. And not only that, this, this also attracts a lot of birds. Um, uh, and then a lot of birds like bluebirds, um, hummingbirds, um, uh, they're great at uh, reducing pest populations in the garden too. Now, I'm going to show you uh, a cross section of some of the insects that I have seen in my rose garden or in, um, Gardens across the country that I, you know, that I have seen that, that cause some pest, uh, cause some pest problems. These are the aphids. These are the first ones that come in. I haven't seen any aphids yet in my garden, but you can see um, aphids can build in tremendous populations. The um, uh, when you get to this point, uh, you better do something about it by syringing or by by uh, applying some pesticide, but um, uh, you don't want to get to this point. Um, aphids build up the tremendous populations really fast because they are born pregnant. Uh, most of the aphids you're going to see in the spring are females and they're already born pregnant. And in this slide, you can see that um, this female is pushing a, uh, an embryo uh, out of her, out of her uh, rear end. And like I said, in about, in about a week's time, that embryo is going to be a full female and it's going to start laying eggs again. And this is why aphids can build up in tremendous populations. Aphids also um, excrete a product called honeydew, which, um, which is loved by ants. And in the ants um, protect the aphids, they, uh, they uh, um, farm the aphids, they move them from one plant to another, and um, Anth, uh, ants can be very uh, disruptive in the garden because um, because they protect the aphids. So uh, I always recommend that you uh, you get rid of the ants. 
and by using base, base stations. Um, and then, um, then, then, then that way the beneficial insects can take care of the aphids. And uh, um, if you let the honeydew kind of stay on the uh, on the leaves of your of your plants, um, you're going to get sooty molds. And um, whenever you see sooty molds, it tells you that um, there was some uh, honeydew, and you have an aphid problem, or you have a scale problem, or a leafhopper problem, or a, or a wildfly problem somewhere in the plant. So those are the signs that you use to, to find the pest. And um, another, another group of insects that are the scale insects. And you can see that it's in red. Scale insects don't look like anything like insects. They look like, um, uh, like clams or a shell, but underneath that, the, that um, protective um, uh, case, you're going to see uh, um, uh, the the actual body of the of the uh, aphid of the uh, scale, and then like on the on the right hand side, you're going to see the the eggs all around that uh, the mother scale. And um, there's a lot of different species of scale uh, scale insects. These are examples of San Jose scale, which is very very common on roses. Um, I see it uh, numerous times in uh, when I visit people's gardens. Um, this is California red scale on roses. Um, this, this again, the, very, very common. Um, this, uh, when I was in Florida, I found some California red scale in Florida. Um, the best uh, control method for scale insects is using oil, uh, horticulture oils. And again, um, read the label uh, for the horticulture oils. Um, and um, the horticulture oils uh, will smother the aphids, I mean, the um, the uh, scales, and then it will kill them. But uh, several treatments uh, will be necessary. Uh, whenever you uh, you apply in any type of pesticide, make sure you, re you read the label because even uh, horticulture oils, uh, soaps, mm -hmm. uh, will kill beneficial insects. Anyway, um, another, another um, organism that you find in the garden is not an insect, but are the spider mites. The spider mites are very, very tiny uh, creatures. They're actually spiders and they spin uh, uh, silk. Um, and then the, they feed on the underside of the leaves and um, they suck individual cells uh, from, the, uh, from the underside of the leaves. Um, and you can see that this uh, this leaf right here of this rose is highly um, damaged by by the sucking uh, action of uh, spider mites. If I was to turn that leaf over, uh, there would be just thousands of uh, little spider mites underneath. Um, you can see see the webbing right here. You're going to see whenever you have a uh, a spider mite infestation, uh, if you turn the leaf over you're going to see a lot of this uh, webbing, kind of a dirty area with, uh, with thousands of little tiny um, uh, creatures uh, sucking uh, the, the, the foliage or nesting in that webbing material. So um, for those that are taking the test, um, be aware of, uh, that these things are very, very, very tiny and that they suck the uh, juices out of the, uh, out of the plants from the underside of the leaves. Then of course we get we get into another very very tiny insect called trips. Trips um, um, they're in an interesting group of insects. Um, trips uh, that's the correct spelling uh, with an S um, because you never see one. Okay, you always see thousands of them. They're very tiny. They have rasping sucking mouth parts, and um, and they look the 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 immature um insects they look like real tiny 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 worms um the size of this the trips um the ones that you find on roses are between two millimeters so you have to really squint um uh if you were to look at a trips uh, they have feathery wings and uh, that's that's one of the key characteristics of trips they're very very tiny generally you find them on the on the uh, uh, on the um, 
between the petals of, of flowers, uh, thus for the flower trips, or you can um, uh, you can find you know the sachili trips done in in uh, in the southern parts of the, of the country, and uh, that one also that that feeds on the leaves. Now, trips um, have uh, three life cycles. Some people say it's four life cycles, uh, uh, the stages. Uh, they have an egg, uh, a first instar, second instar, and then uh, the third instar should be is called a prepupa or a pupa. Um, but it's really not a true pupa, okay? And then from there, they, there's an adult. Um, the first two instars are the ones that cause the major damage on roses. Um, they, they're the ones that do a lot of the uh, damage to the petals and to the, um, and to the leaves of roses. Um, here's an example of flower, flower trips. Again, flower, you can see that it's in red. Uh, this Flower trips are found between the petals. They're very tiny, and they they uh, rasp the surface of the petals, leaving these uh, brown trails on the on the on the leaf on the leaves uh, petals of roses. You can see on this um, in this case, you can see the brown um, uh, 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 damage. Uh, those are feeding trails uh, due to the rasping uh, sucking part of the. Uh, Flower trips, chili trips, um, uh, and that's the correct spelling, uh, chili <laughs> with a double L. And um, that one um, came in uh, um, around 2003, 2000, 2005, um, first in, in uh, Florida. Um, I was able, I was the one that diagnosed it for the state of Florida um, back in around 2005. Um, it was uh, first diagnosed, um, found by um, our friend um, uh, Jeff uh, Kolst, uh, um, uh, Kulich, um, and uh, he contacted me, and then I verified it that it was um, chili trips. Um, and then since it, um, it has moved across the country through the southern parts of the country. And uh, in 2015, it was the, again I diagnosed it in Southern California for the first time. Um, it's a very, very tiny uh, um, uh, insect, uh, smaller than uh, the, in the two millimeter range that the uh, flower trips is. This one is about uh, 1.2 millimeters in size. Um, chili trips uh, uh, loves hot weather, hot, hot, dry weather. Um, you can see in this graph that um, you know it, uh, in cool situations, uh, when temperatures are around 61 degrees, it takes about 40 days. But when um, when the temperatures uh, uh, go high in the 90s, you know the chili trips, uh, the life cycle is about 11 days. So this is um, a very short time period. Um, chili trips um, again, those that are that are taking the test should know that chili trips, um, you can diagnose it because of the damage that they do from the other side of the leaves. You, you see this scarring damage on the, on the uh, lower part of the leaves. Um, and then uh, these are pictures from uh, Southern California. These are, um, anyway, you can see the, uh, uh, the, uh, the wrinkled uh, small uh, uh, leaves, They're very distorted. Um, you can see on this one right here, uh, the the leaves are very small, distorted. Um, I, whenever whenever I see this type of damage, I know that right away that that's chili trips. Um, uh, anyway, I call this uh, rat, this kind of damage uh, rat tails. And then of course, there's a lot of different insects in the yard that um, that uh, you find, and these are examples of grasshoppers. Or longhorn grasshoppers. Um, um, these longhorn grasshoppers we call them uh, katydids, and they lay their eggs on the um, on the stems, like in the right on the left hand side. Um, some lay their eggs on the leaves. Um, the eggs look like lentils, and then the uh, uh, the young um, uh, nymphs don't look anything like the adult. 
uh, they're kind of psychedelic. They, they're kind of multicolor. But then as they grow, they turn, um, the ones in North America, they turn um, uh, uh, green, just like the, uh, the slide in the middle of the graph. Um, and then, uh, and of course, in the East Coast and in many parts of the, now the, the Midwest, all the way to Denver, we have Japanese beetles. Um, Japanese beetles um, um, are a, a big, big, huge problem in the East Coast. Um, a lot of people just can't enjoy the roses in the summer months because of Japanese beetles. In fact, a lot of people in the, in the um, Midwest, uh, East, they sacrifice the uh, summer bloom because of the uh, Japanese beetles. There are some uh, chemicals that will control it. Um, um, uh, anyway, um, and these chemicals can be uh, can be gotten in um, uh, a lot of the local nurseries. Uh, look for um, 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 Japanese beetle control and apply and make sure that you read the label. Um, these are pictures that I took at um, in Connecticut when I was when I visit over there, and you can see that uh, Japanese beetles cause a lot of damage to the door, the roses and to the uh, other anything that's green. And then of course the larvae um, they live in the soil uh, most of their life they live in the soil and then in in June they start emerging from the ground. And again this depends on on the area that you're. That you're, that you're located. Um, one uh, method of control is mil milky spore, but again, uh, depends on the soil type. And then it takes a long time for some of these diseases to, to take effect. Um, and uh, some diseases can control insects, um, you know, between three to five years. Milky spore is one of those that is a community-based program where you have to work with a community to introduce it throughout the whole area. Um, in the West, uh, we have um, other type of beetles. Uh, this is the hopia beetle feeding on the uh, on, uh, rose that I was planning to exhibit in a rose show. This one always comes in the area around April 15. So around April 15, that's when I looked in my garden for um, for hapia beetles, and then uh, usually I see a whole bunch of uh, birds feeding on them. So this is why I'm very happy to that um, um, that I have a bird uh, garden in my in my backyard. Uh, Rose curculios uh, are uh, can be a problem in certain areas of the country. Uh, these are uh, pictures that I took um, from the Bay Area where where uh, rose curculios uh, can be a big problem. Uh, and again, this is an early uh, pest um, um, that shows up in the, in, in uh, usually around, uh, when, when roses start to bud, which is usually in, in March, April, and they stay into June in our area, and that's in California. Uh, in other in parts of the country, it might be different times. But this is what I was telling you, always keep a calendar and then jot the, the dates when you, when you start seeing some of these pests because they're very, very punctual. They always come at, at, a, certain, um, at a certain time of the year. And I can predict um, this just from the, from, from the 40 uh, years that I have uh, been growing roses. Um, caterpillars are a lot of different caterpillars. Uh, some of them blend in with the stems of roses, so they're diff very difficult to, to see. Uh, this one uh, you can see is uh, one that I find when I'm pruning my roses. So generally what I do is I, uh, uh, they're not very common, so I only see one or two in the, in the whole garden. But when I see them, I usually um, grab them and apply some mechanical control. And I'll show you the type of controls that I use. And uh, this is a little um, inchworm. And you can see that it's very difficult to see, but if you squint, it'll be at the uh, at toward the um, base of the plant of the uh, stem, um, very tiny. And uh, but you can see that even when it's tiny, it has done a lot of damage to the rose. And this is on the underside of the leaf. And uh, my biggest problem in in my area, um, and uh, I would say that in in 
in um, most of California are the fruit tree leaf rollers. And again, these are very punctual. They always come into my garden um, uh, the, last, the last week in March and they stay through, um, through the middle of um, uh, April. And um, what I did to, con to, to control this pest is that I avoided planting roses under, under uh, oak trees and under um, uh, trees. Um, and I have a few roses still planted under those trees, but those are the places that I go in the, uh, I go to and I monitor the population. And then when I see those um, caterpillars coming down from the, from the top of the trees on a silken strand, I grab them and then I squish them. And that's my mechanical way of controlling this pest. And, and I don't control this pest using pesticides. I just kind of use the squish method. Um, but um, a few of them can cause a lot of damage. And uh, there's a, a lot of different caterpillars. Um, I see that this, uh, this insect is um, often mistaken for serpentine leaf flies. Um, these are cambium miners. And um, I don't have this pest in my yard, but whenever I go to the Bay Area or certain other areas of the country, I see them. Um, and uh, you can see the serpentine um, a minor type uh, damage on the leaves, on the leaflets. Um, again, this is a minor, a, a very minor pest. It's just doing cosmetic damage. But if you're an exhibitor, you don't. This is unacceptable. So you have to use some, um, you have to use some uh, pesticides in order to control this uh, this this pest. And you find this is a, a leaf, uh, a cambium leaf miner, on the leaves, and this one in the stems. And uh, again, um, um, it's a minor pest. These cause cosmetic damage. Um, now, I, I brought in uh, uh, snails and slugs, mainly because uh, the damage that uh, they do is very, very similar to that of uh, chewing insects, such as uh, beetles and grasshoppers. So, but uh, one of the telltale tale signs is that they leave a silvery slime um, 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 behind whenever they feed. So what I do is uh, if I see damage on the, on the foliage, I turn the leaf over and then I look for silvery trails. If I don't see any, any silvery trails, then, I, uh, then I, I probably think that it's a, a beetle or a, a caterpillar or, or a grasshopper. And um, if I see gr um, uh, snails and slugs, then I take care of uh, by using uh, uh, um, uh, barriers like uh, copper banding or uh, or um, uh, uh, sluggo, which is uh, uh, an easy uh, material to use. Um, in the East Coast, in parts of the U.S., um, also in, in the Northwest, like in Seattle and Portland, the uh, rose mist can be a huge problem. Uh, um, I tell people that if they don't see any, any blooms in the roses, they might have rose mist. And rose mage are very, very tiny uh, flies. Uh, they, they're mosquito-like, and uh, very, but they're very tiny. Um, I work with a with a, a midge uh, in biological control of uh, weeds, and you can see how small these things are. Uh, these are um, millimeter ruler, and you can see that um, they're under two millimeters long. So they're very, very tiny, okay? This is not rose mitch, okay? This is a, a biological control agent that I use for controlling a weed. Um, but in, whenever I go to Connecticut to visit my friends, I always, um, I always look for rose mitch and um, I see the uh, very diagnostic uh, burnt tips um, of the roses. And then I look for yellowing of the of the uh, tips, and then if I grab the yellowing of the uh, you know the tips are kind of turning yellow, then I can uh, I can uh, find the larvae feeding feeding on the on the terminal terminal end of the uh, of the of the bud. The uh, larvae of uh, rosemary they girdle they girdle the um, the stem 
and then they cause that um, um, blackish um, um, tip. Uh, rose slugs um, can be a huge problem in certain areas. Um, uh, this is the um, uh, the uh, rose slug slow, uh, slow fly, and this one feeds on the top on the top surface of the leaves. And you can see that um, it kind of has a kind of a uh, green yellow uh, look. Um, anyway, they they skeletonize the foliage of, ro of roses like this. And then in severe situations, basically they take all the green out of the um, out of the green out of the leaves like that. Another problem that I see often, especially in the Bay Area and certain parts of the country, are the bristly rose slug. And you can see that this one feeds on the underside of the leaves. And this is very typical damage. Um, you see this um, uh, windows, skeletonized windows. And if you, if you look at the larvae in high magnification, you can see that it's, it's covered with little bristles. And then, of course, uh, another pest that I see, um, well, a lot of people consider this a pest, um, are the cane borers. And cane borers are, um, uh, they can be bees or they can be wasps, okay? Um, the ones that I have in the picture here is a little wasp, a little tiny wasp, um, um, about uh, three, uh, three eighths of an inch. And it's a beneficial insect, actually, because it preys on aphids. It's an aphid wasp, and uses the um, uses the uh, the uh, stems to drill a hole, and then in the stem, um, it um, it lays its eggs um, on uh, on uh, uh, chambers that it builds by uh, scraping the sides of the of the canes. They build these chambers, and then she lays the eggs in there. So. Um, again, if you don't want uh, cane borers in your in your garden, uh, try to keep the aphids under control. Okay, and uh, if uh, if you keep the aphids under control, this uh, cane borers uh, will move somewhere else. So that's my recommendation from many many years of working with cane borers um, when I was a graduate student. Uh, leaf cutter bees uh, can be a problem in certain areas where um, where they uh, harvest them, for, I mean, where they use them for uh, pollination purposes. Um, uh, leaf cutter bees um, are tremendous pollinators. So I tend to just kind of um, um, let them do some damage to my, my uh, I'm tolerant, in other words. I don't uh, take any action against them, um, mainly because I consider them very important pollinators in, in my yard. And of course, um, um, leaving the, in the insects uh, section, I just wanna show you my mechanical ways that I control pests. This is uh, the fruit tree leaf roller, you know, that I showed you before. That was my, that's been my, my worst pest. And what I do is uh, whenever I see them in my, underneath the, um, uh, on the roses under, uh, underneath my, my trees, I go in there and I grab them and then I give them a squeeze. And then of course, uh, uh, three years ago, I visited uh, my friend, uh, Marcy Martin, and she um, she introduced me to marmoray stink bugs. So um, anyway, uh, out of uh, interest, I grabbed one of them and I squeezed it. You know, I squeezed it really hard like that. And of course, it's a stink bug. So it stunk. And I couldn't get that order, um, and I had to catch a plane later on. And people around me kind of look at me with a, you know, kind of, uh, you know, what have you been eating or what have you been in? So, you know, be careful what you squish. Um, my friend uh, Marcy uh, uses a bazooka that she got on Amazon. And what she does is whenever she finds uh, some, some of these marmorated stink bugs uh, in, her, um, in her house, she uses the, the bazooka to suck them up. And uh, she uses them for, um, 
I guess you used to sit in the garden too. So, you know, if you're kind of squeamish about um, squishing insects, you can get yourself a bazooka and then use them using it to uh, collect insects in the yard. Um, now, rose diseases. Um, I'm an entomologist. Um, I have a little bit of background in plant pathology. Um, so I invited Dr. Uh, Mark Winham to be available for, uh, for half an hour to answer any questions that I might get stuck with. But uh, rose diseases, um, uh, you know, they, they depend on the susceptible host um, in available pathogen, you know, like uh, fungus, and then the right environmental conditions. This is, um, this is known as the, uh, the uh, plant disease triangle. And then of course, uh, it takes time for this stuff to take place. Um, when I was a graduate student, there, there was always a test that, uh, that was given in, in, um, in the plant pathology um, yeah, class. Um, now, diseases, uh, they can be, um, uh, they can be abiotic diseases, in other words, caused by environmental uh, uh, factors, um, physiological, nutritional, uh, you can, you can, um, if you overwater or underwater uh, your plants, uh, you, they're going to show some symptoms. If you have the pH is in balance, again, show some symptoms, environmental extremes. Um, air pollutants, uh, if you use uh, Roundup around your roses, you're going to see some pesticide damage. Uh, if you have drainage issues, you're going to have some uh, uh, symptoms on the rose. A lot of these things are mistaken for, for diseases caused by, by biotic uh, organisms. So. Um, in this picture, you're going to see the first picture uh, on the left uh, is uh, nutritional. The second one is um, is lack of water, uh, and the third one is uh, uh, Roundup damage. You can see that these things look like diseases, but they're not. This these things can be corrected by certain actions. Um, this is a um, a rose bush that has been hit by Roundup. And you can see the bunching of the uh, of the leaves, and uh, you know uh, the leaves are very distorted. So these are examples of um, in, uh, abiotic uh, uh, factors. Now, for disease for for um, uh, diseases caused by biotic factors, so by or co by caused by organisms, um, we we we're going to be looking at uh, nematodes, bacteria, fungi, and viruses. Um, nematodes are very, very tiny. You're not gonna be able to see a nematode, but um, they they can cause um, um, uh, damage to the um, to many parts of the of the uh, rose. Uh, this is an example of a root nod nematode, and these are called these um, nodules on the on the roots of uh, of your roses. Um, uh, these are uh, examples of some of the other nematodes that you might have. In, in your roses, but uh, the root nanimatos are, are the most common that I have seen, and especially in, in other plants like tomatoes or so. You know, when you have a, uh, a susceptible tomato and um, you, uh, this is why they tell you to, um, to rotate your plant, your um, vegetables, because um, uh, some of these um, uh, plants may be infected with um, uh, nematodes or some, uh, fungus that you don't want in your garden. Okay, these are um, uh, cultural practices that you can apply to fungal uh, organisms um, that I'm going to be discussing. So whenever I, when I whenever I talk about fungal organisms, uh, all of these things apply. Okay, um, first of all, you you try to uh, find resistant varieties if available. Uh, we talk about knockout roses, for example. Uh, in my garden, I always recommend a rose called uh, uh, D. Clark because it's, it's bulletproof. Um, whenever I see uh, infected plant material, um, I remove it. Um, uh, I, I avoid overcrowding of, of the rose beds. You know, uh, 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 
put some distance between the roses and then um, open up the centers so that you get good air circulation. Um, avoid overhead uh, irrigation or sprinklers. Um, try to water um, early in the morning if possible. And, and then um, this will allow the, the leaves to be dry during the day. The worst time to, uh, to water is it would be in the, you know, in the evening because then the, the water will stay on the foliage for, for a long time and then that's conducive for black spot and, and other diseases. Um, sanitize your tools whenever you, run, you, you cut into, um, into infecting um, plant material um, and, uh, and then avoid um, uh, injuring your rose canes. Uh, use sharp tools, okay? So you're going to be applying a lot of these culture controls for a lot of your fungal diseases. Uh, powdery mildew is, is one of the most common that I used to have. Um, you can see that uh, uh, powdery mildew can, uh, can be um, uh, diagnosed by the the white uh, powdery mycelial growth on the on the uh, on the leaves, uh, peduncles, and stems. Um, and then uh, what the fungus will do is uh, it will distort the uh, the stems and the leaves, and and then um, you know the spores can be carried by the wind. Okay, so um, you can see that uh, this this is a question in the, in your test, and basically um, you know the uh, ideal situation for powder mildew is uh, warm days, um, uh, and then um, um, uh, cool nights. Um, and then the, the cool nights allows for high humidity um, uh, that favor the uh, germinations of the spores, okay? So know that. Um, and then uh, if you, you can blast uh, powder and mildew by, uh, by using uh, uh, water from the hose, you can just blast the uh, conidia uh, because uh, they burst with water. Um, the uh, the fungus the spores uh, they um, um, they overwent on the on the stems and um, on the leaves on the real tiny leaves and on the uh, on the on the uh, prickles and this is an, inf an example of a uh, severe infestation of powdery mildew um, they are resistant varieties and in my garden I always um, I, I always um, recommend the use of resistant varieties. And I have gotten rid of a lot of plants because uh, they're, they're disease prone. Um, dormant oils can be, used, uh, can be used for the control of, um, of uh, powdery mildew, especially in the winter. Um, and then uh, fungicides can be used uh, as a preventative for powdery mildew. Black spot, um, you know, the black spot has a very characteristic um, uh, round spots. And then the, uh, the margin of the, uh, of the spots are kind of feathery. Um, you can also find um, um, uh, purple, stem, purple um, uh, irregular blotches on, on, the, uh, on the stems. Um, uh, and then of course, uh, 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 black spot can cause uh, severe defoliation. And, um, uh, black spot, um, if you water uh, at the wrong time of the, of the day uh, and, and, and the water stays in the, in the foliage for at least uh, for, for more than seven, day, seven hours, uh, you're going to get a lot of um, um, black spot. So you need to, um, to water early in the day so that the leaves ha have a chance to to, uh, to dry. Um, so what I do is I water, uh, when I use sprinklers, I use it in the, in the morning hours, uh, like at seven o'clock. And then that way by, by uh, nine, nine o'clock, uh, 10 o'clock, uh, the foliage is, is dry. So, and then um, now rust, rose rust is not, is not found throughout the, to, throughout the country. Uh, doesn't like the um, the coldness or the the uh, low temperatures that you you find in the uh, in the east coast, but in the west it's a it's a big problem. Uh, 
uh, rose rust, you can find, you can uh, diagnose it because of the um, yellow or orangish pustules on the underside of the leaves. At this time of the year, which is the winter, you, in California, you see the uh, black spores, and those are the, um, the overwintering spores, okay? And again, um, um, uh, rust prefers the, um, you know, uh, uh, high moisture um, and um, uh, cool days, high moisture. And this is the top of the leaves, and this is what they look like. You can see those, um, those yellow dots um, on the on the top of the leaf, and then um, you can see that um, uh, this another another example of uh, rose rust. Um, there are some available pesticides. Uh, I mean fungicides. Um, again, avoid overcrowding. Uh, pick up infested um, leaves whenever you see them. That would be my recommendation. Um, rose canker. Whenever I uh, I uh, see it, I prune it out. Uh, um, I just, um, uh, whenever, uh, you know, right now that I'm pruning my garden, uh, if I see it, I make sure that it's pruned out. Um, and I don't, um, I find that it's not very um, easy co to control with pesticides, with uh, fungicides, um, uh, but I use some, I use some, um, I just prune it out. That's my, my major thing that I do. And then, of course, it's the least leaf spots um, caused by anthracnose and sarospora. And again, depends on where you are, you're going to find this, these things. Um, these leaf spots um, are often com confused with a black spot or downy mildew or, or whatever. Um, Sarcospora, I find it in the East Coast uh, where it's hot and humid. And anthracnose, I find it in the, in the in the West Coast, uh, especially in the in the cooler parts of um, the coastal areas of California, um, they're very similar. Um, the controls are very similar for those of black spot. But again, um, uh, I I try not to spray for or um, in my garden. Uh, and this is an example of anthracnose. You you see that purple, the purple uh, ring around the gray. Um, center that's very diagnostic for anthracnose. And this is a um, picture that I borrow from uh, Mark's uh, presentation. This is Sarascora. And um, another spot disease is called uh, Botrytis. Botrytis can be uh, severe, especially in the winter months or in the cool parts of the year. And it's called a uh, gray um, uh, fungus. Um, it also goes by um, uh, bloom rot. Um, the gray brown mycelial growth is very characteristic. And again, I find it during the, time, the cool times of the year, uh, high moisture, and especially when it rains a lot. Um, it starts with um, this um, uh, round lesions on the petals, and then the infection. Uh, spreads very quickly in about a week time the whole the whole bloom would be brown uh, with the, the spores um, I tried to uh, I tried strict um, uh, sanitation um, because I don't want the uh, blooms to be uh, to be covered with the with the brown uh, 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 fungus so I dispose the um, the infected plant material in the trash can, and um, you know, there's nothing, uh, nothing I can do to control Mother Nature. So I do my best in my garden to um, not to use uh, watering methods uh, that in, that encourage um, botrytis, uh, such as overhead re irrigation. And this is how uh, my friend um, John Maria. Uh, uh, covers his uh, blooms and protects them from uh, uh, leaf spots in, in his roses. Um, John Maria is one of the uh, top exhibitors in the country. And uh, this is called the, um, uh, the bottle. Um, anyway, um, he used to use this in all his roses and that's how he won so many trophies. 
Donnie mildew is um, is very similar. Um, a lot of people mistake it for um, for black spot, but the the um, purple um, black to black um, spots are irregular. They can be angular. They can follow the um, the borders of the of the uh, um, of the uh, uh, veins, um, and um, uh, basically the leaves uh, turn yellow and defoliate in in very short time. Uh, oftentimes, you, the those uh, spots uh, have necrotic areas. The fungus is intracellular, and then the the it overwinters as dormant um, mycelia or oospores in the inside the plant uh, inside the plant. And um, when I first uh, uh, got acquainted with downy mildew, you know, I, I saw these purple spots uh, like this. I turn them over, and then I would see this fed this um, this um, downy material on the underside of the leaves. And this is why it's called downy mildew. However, this is not uh, wow. very common. This is um, it only you only see this under ideal conditions. Krangol, uh, there's a question on Krangol, and Krangol is caused by a bacteria, Agrobacterium, Agrobacterium tumus faciens. You can find it on the uh, on the crown of the of the of the roses. You can find it up in the um, up high in the in the stems. Uh, you can also find it in the roots. And um, um, you know the bacteria comes in from uh, from uh, through wounds that you, that are either you caused or were caused by by uh, by pruning, grafting, mechanical means. Um, and the bacteria can persist in the soil for a long time. And I've been fighting uh, Krangol because uh, there are some um, uh, uh, commercial uh, um, uh, dealers that, um, that have some Krangol problems in their in their plants. And uh, so what I do is I, um, uh, whenever I buy new plants, uh, bare root plants, I put them in pots. And then I uh, I looked at them for six months, and then I put them in the ground uh, because I want to avoid uh, the uh, uh, crangle. Um, some people recommend uh, digging some of the soil, and uh, and then uh, putting new soil in in there. But again, um, um, I uh, sometimes I doubt if this is a, a good uh, practice. Um, road mosaic. Is caused by uh, um, by a virus, um, and you can see the discoloration on the leaves, like this. And rose mosaics are complex of um, of um, viruses. Um, rose mosaic can uh, can uh, um, impact the uh, flower production and the vigor of the plant. And um, rose mosaic is uh, mainly transmitted through um, the way you. The way uh, rose mosaics transmit is, is by vegetative propagation. That is, from um, if you take cuttings from infested plants, um, you, you take science or you take a rootstock that are infested. That's how you you get it. Um, uh, so um, again, by planting uh, uh, bare root roses for in in pots for six months, I can see if rose mosaic is present or not. And again, I bought uh, some roses that has some rose mosaic, and um, I tell, usually tell the um, the grower that they have a problem. And these are some of the um, symptoms of rose mosaic. You can see the various um, uh, patterns in the in the in the leaves. Um, now, the following slides I borrowed them from uh, Mark uh, Windham's. A presentation that he gave in uh, San Diego. Um, actually, I gave it for him. He was not able to to make it. Um, but rose uh, rose rosette is a big is becoming a big 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 problem um, in uh, many parts of the country uh, in the in the rose industry. I uh, I started uh, seeing rose rosette uh, in Northern California in 1978 when I started working uh, for the department. And I found it in uh, wild roses um, up in uh, extreme northern California and into Oregon. Um, the rose rosette is uh, transmitted by a real tiny mite called a blister mite. 
Um, and uh, you can see the, the symptoms for Rose Rosette. Um, and this, again, this is from Mark uh, Windham's. Um, you, uh, you have misshapen uh, flower buds. You have um, internal spaces that are shortened. You have extreme thorniness. And you have uh, the, uh, the leaflets uh, are also uh, kind of elongated, um, um, deformed. And you and you have a red coloration on the um, on the uh, on the stem, and then you have the distorted sepals. If you leave that alone, in a few in uh, in a few years, um, you going you know that you have to dig up the whole plant because you can see on the right on the left you can see some healthy uh, well some plants that had the rose rosette, and then several years later you can see the same plants. Uh, they look terrible. Um, uh, Mark recommends uh, um, taking action as soon as you see uh, as soon as you see the um, rose rosette in your garden. You can take the stem off and then keep an eye on the plant. If you if you don't take action right away, uh, the mites will build up in populations and then they they start dispersing. So. It's very important to keep uh, keep an eye on rose rosette because um, it, it can take over uh, uh, you know your garden. Uh, the best um, defense for rose rosette is that as soon as you see plants with rose rosette, you bag them up like this and you dig them out. And then of course rose rosette is often mistaken for Roundup damage. Okay, thank you very much. I. I'll be around for the next half hour to answer questions. And so I'm done. All right. Thank you, Mr. Boyegas, for a wonderful presentation. As you indicated, we'll go into a 30 minute QA session. Remember, if you are consulting Rosarian candidate, to post candidate prior to asking your question. Ah, so Eva Hughes has a couple of questions. Uh, can diluted vinegar be used for powdery mildew? Uh, repeat the question. Can diluted vinegar be used for powdery mildew? I would not recommend it. You're going to impact the the plant in a different way. I don't. I would. I would never re, uh, uh, spray vinegar on my uh, on my roses, especially uh, even if it's diluted. All right, second question. How can you distinguish rose canker uh, from cane burn? Um, well, the uh, cane burn, um, oftentimes uh, uh, you see a lot of necrotic area in one side of the, of the stem, especially where the sun is, is hitting it, whereas the um, uh, the rose canker is going to be mainly on the uh, um, is going to be uh, in an area where there was the, some damage done, like pruning or uh, some mechanical damage done to the stem. All right, Linda Short would like to know what plants are best to attract predator insects. Um, any any plant that um, Flowers a lot. Um, I like to use um, in, in the slide that you saw. Um, you know, you can see that I use a lot of um, um, uh, uh, plants uh, like yarrows, um, uh, uh, sunflowers, um, some of the uh, um, mints are a tremendous plants to attract beneficial insects. So those are the type of things that I use. What I do is I I, I usually go to um, um, to uh, nurseries, and then I look at the uh, plants that I like, especially those that are threatening a lot of bees and and um, other insects, uh, especially bees, and then I buy those. All right. The next question comes from Pr Priscilla Batista. 
is Bayer All-in-One Rosen, Rosenflower Care, a product that is safe to apply to, in a small rose garden? Um, yes, it is, but read the label. Uh, read the label because the label will tell you um, that um, it will kill a lot of beneficial insects if it's not, if it's not applied accordingly. Um, I, I would apply it as a drench uh, around the, the, the soil, uh, you know, around the, uh, the, the roses. And then, um, um, and that's the way I would apply it. I would not spray it. Um, if I had to spray something, I would spray it in the evening when uh, the, the chance of um, bees and other, uh, well, mainly bees uh, would, not, would not be available, uh, would not be around. Um, but again, any, any pesticide that you use, including, uh, you know, like insecticidal soap or neem oil, or um, uh, a lot of this, this uh, uh, so-called um, uh, low uh, uh, toxicity pesticides will impact the, the beneficials. So be very careful how you apply it. All right, Lauren English has a question. She's a candidate. Rose Midget has entered her garden in Laywood, Kansas the last few years. What kind of preventative measures should she take in May when her roses begin to bloom? Uh, rose Midget is a big challenge. Um, I would make sure that this rose midge, that uh, the problem is, um, make sure that you you get uh, you get a diagnose that is actually rose midge, because um, um, it's a frequent question that I get in California because we had a we have an infestation of rose midge in the Bay Area, in the north uh, in in Northern California. Uh, mainly in, the, uh, in uh, um, Sevastopol area. And um, I find that uh, uh, a lot of, uh, there's some problems with, um, with, the bud, with the terminal buds not blooming, and, but not caused by rose midge. So I would make sure that I have rose midge, okay? Now, what I would do, First, I would uh, put some um, uh, monitoring uh, traps uh, like yellow sticky uh, tape or yellow sticky cards uh, near the roses, um, you know, like uh, maybe five inches from, 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 the, from the ground. Um, uh, and when, when you have about uh, one inch of growth on your roses, that's usually when rose midge starts emerging from the ground. The larvae are found in the ground, uh, the pupae, and um, and the the rose midge starts uh, um, coming out of the ground when when you get about one inch of growth. So get those uh, get those insects identified. Um, I do this for some of my some of my friends in uh, 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 the Yankee district, and I have uh, identified them for them, and then. Uh, once they identify it, then it's, it's, uh, it's a good idea to, to put a soil insecticide um, in around the roses. Uh, there are some uh, 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 soil insecticides um, that are, uh, are used for, um, for uh, Japanese beetle control and also includes uh, rose midge. So that would be my recommendation. Oh, thank you. Uh, candidate Montine Ross has this question. Can you talk about winter moth damage on roses? Uh, I have no experience with winter moth. Um, I, um, my friends up in um, um, uh, uh, Cape Cod uh, have, um, have told me about it, but I have no experience on it. So I cannot talk about it with, you know, because I haven't, you know, I, I never seen it. I haven't been to, um, to that area in the winter to talk about it. Um, I could be full of it. So 
I rather not talk about it. Um, but uh, if if um, this um, but if, if I get his uh, um, this person's email, I'll look it up and I'll talk to some of my friends in the East Coast, and I will answer that question. Okay. Mary Cookson has this question. She lives in an area that is infested by spotted lantern fly. She's using traps and scraping egg masses and dunking mist, but still getting enough honeydew from the adults in fall to attract sooty mold. Is there anything she can do to help avoid the uh, sooty mold? She's considering removing her beautiful willow tree because it attracts so many of the lantern moths, flies. Um, that's another one that I don't have any experience um, because it's a fairly new problem in the last uh, five years or so. So again, I would um, uh, I would recommend that uh, that uh, that question be sent to me uh, um, as an email. And um, I will look it up, and um, you know, in a few days, I will answer that question. Not uh, in the next half hour, but in, the, in give me a, a few days, and I will answer that question. All right, Terry Hunter, would you please share treatment methods for thieves? For thieves? Yes. Um. Okay. Uh, the. Um, that, again, depends on what you're going to be doing with with the uh, roses. Um, my uh, that's a it's a challenge to take care of uh, trips on roses. Um, in the past, I used to use um, uh, some of the heavy uh, materials, um, uh, but because of um, the um, the impact with to bees. Um, we have um, we don't uh, use the heavy materials anymore. Uh, um, what we recommend is that we use something like merit, uh, not merit. Um, um, oh, I have a mental problem right now. Um, oh, I, anyway, there's some there's an organic material that uh, we we rec highly recommend. Uh, give me a few minutes and I'll. All this stuff will come back to me. Um, um, <laughs> I have a senior moment. Um, I know what it is, but I can't think of it. Um, um, oh God! Um, give me a minute. I'll I'll come back to it. Okay. Uh, Floyd Sewell wants to know how to get rid of root knot nematodes. Uh, there's there's no way you can get rid of them. Um, you can lessen the uh, the um, again. I would make sure that you have the root nematodes before you take any action. Um, you can uh, solarize the soil, but it's not. We don't. There there are no treatments available for root nematodes. And um, I don't know if Mark is around. Um, but if Mark is around, he maybe he can uh, uh, he can tell us um, if he knows of any methods. But as far as I know, there's no method for controlling root nematodes except uh, solarizing the soil. Um, hi, Baldo. We do have Mark Windham on the line, and we've just been trying to make sure his audio is working. So, Mark, I don't know if you are um, you can hear me, and you can also help Baldo out on this particular question. The, um, my suggestion is rotating, rotating, um, you know, kind of don't use the same area, uh, but make, making sure that you have, uh, that you, you diagnose the problem before you take any action. Well, Bobo, this is Craig. On the previous question, were you thinking of spinosad? Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, in Captain the, in, Jackson. <laughs> correct. I'm so <laughs> I'm glad you you thought of it. <laughs> I could not think of uh, Spinoza. 
<laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, Spinoza can be used, uh, but again, read the label because uh, there are some limits uh, as to the number of times that you can use Spinoza. I believe that you can use it uh, no more than five times in the year. All right, the next question comes from, I'm going to butcherize this guy, person's name, Shinichi Harada would like to know what can we use to sanitize pruners when you prune diseased roses? Um, well, in the past, I used to use a, a one to 10 dilution of uh, bleach, but of course, uh, you know, I don't use that anymore because I ended up with uh, uh, pens that uh, had all kinds of different colors. Uh, and also it uh, corrodes the, uh, the tools. Um, so what I do now is I use um, alcohol. Um, I use a fresh bottle of alcohol. Um, but I, I also use some, um, uh, I also carry in my bucket that I use for, for uh, demonstrations of pruning um, uh, seminars. I use um, Lysol spray. And I've been using Lysol for the last uh, probably 30 years. Um, I was working with uh, the USDA for the eradication of um, um, uh, white uh, rust on chrysanthemums. And when I was um, working with them on that, um, uh, I noticed that they desterilized their tools with, um, with Lysol. So that's what I use. All right, uh, candidate Mitch Berry would like to know, what predator bugs have you found most effective in combating thrips? Um, the, the best one are the, uh, the small, uh, pirate bugs, that's the best one. But there are some, uh, unfortunately, you can't buy these things, okay? You cannot buy these things. Um, you can, uh, there are some uh, also, uh, a lot of natural enemies that I have seen are the uh, small uh, pirate, pirate bugs. Um, there are some um, predatory mites that also can be, uh, that I, uh, I have seen them. Um, and um, uh, and then uh, there are some uh, tiny flies called uh, long-legged flies, um, uh, family Dolicopodidae, uh, that I have seen going up, uh, you know, in and out of the of the roses, uh, 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 um, uh, hunting for uh, for trips. But I, right. again, you cannot buy these things. <laughs> All right. The next question comes from. Gail Beasley, is soil solarization really possible in Northwest cooler locations like the Pacific Northwest? You know, um, I don't know too much about uh, this subject um, because I have never been uh, happy with so, uh, solar, uh, soil solarization. I have used um, uh, black, um, uh, um, clear plastic over the soil, um, but I always want to use the soil uh, or that area right away. So I have never been that happy. Um, so I don't know the subject. Uh, if Mark can uh, is still in, uh, if, if can jump in and give us an, an opinion, uh, I would appreciate it from Mark. Uh, so. You know, send me that email, and I'll I'll look it up in the next uh, in the next week or so, and then I'll I'll be able to give give a, a better explanation. All right, looks like Mark's uh, left us. Ah, candidate Melissa Bormon wants to know: Is it necessary to burn disease pest effective plant material? If you're allowed to burn in your area. That would be an ideal situation. In fact, uh, a lot of, you know, when I first got in, when I, I first started um, uh, uh, getting into Rose Rosette, that was re the recommended uh, thing to do. But um, I live in Sacramento County and uh, in Sacramento County, you cannot burn. So if you can burn, more power to you. That's the, that, that's the excellent um, 
a recommendation that I use. I wish I, I lived just uh, five miles north of me and that would be in uh, uh, Placer County where I could burn. But um, uh, if you can burn in a safe area, do it. All right, uh, William K. Clan would like to know what options do you suggest to sanitize tools? I already answered that question, but um, I use uh, I use Lysol uh, for the last uh, 30 years. Um, uh, but um, you can use uh, alcohol, or you can you know uh, at least 70 percent alcohol. Uh, use an, a good uh, new bottle. Um, and then uh, in the past, I've used um, a one to ten dilution of uh, bleach. Okay, Jane. Doug All would like to know what plants in Houston area would you recommend planting around your roses to help attract good insects? Um, I, I love yarrow. <laughs> yarrow is the, the ideal plant for me because it just attracts so many. Um, any of the members of the um, um, uh, uh, um, any of the mints also attract a lot of beneficials, um, but the, but the mints, um, uh, you know, they can be very uh, aggressive in the garden or, or bullies in the garden because they they like to take over. But um, if you can find some some spots in in your garden for that, uh, that'll be great. Um, uh, hyssops, hyssops uh, is a member of the of the. Um, um, of the mint family, and uh, they're very beautiful plants, and uh, I love those because uh, hyssops um, can be very uh, fragrant and also attract a lot of beneficial insects as well as birds. So Daniel Broad would like to know: Can you use neem oil to treat scale? Uh, yes, you could. You could, uh, but be very careful. Uh, because you know, um, do it. Um, make sure that you read the directions on it, uh, the label. Um, you know, uh, don't use it when uh, when temperatures are above seventy degrees because uh, you might get some uh, burning of the stems. Uh, but uh, uh, yes, uh, do it in the evening when uh, when it's not so hot, and uh, and be very careful. I would use some. Um, uh, uh, summer type oil if it's uh, during the summer months or when temperatures are um, uh, about 70, 70 degrees. All right, uh, Susan and Dan Spira would like to know, well, aphids over winter and mulch, zone 7A, late last year, they had a huge infestation and would like to avoid getting off to a bad start this spring. Uh, no. They don't know we went through in the, in the uh, mulch. Uh, they have to have some. Um, they they usually overwinter in uh, leaf leaf spurs. Um, you know, like in some of the the on alternate hosts nearby, and they have to have some plant material in order to to uh, overwinter. Um, they can overwinter as eggs um, in the um, uh, uh, in in real cold areas. Um, the the aphids um, uh, will lay their eggs on um, on the flower buds, um, and then uh, the, the those eggs will overwinter there. Um, but no, they will not overwinter on the on the mulch. Okay, uh, candidate Jack Riley would like to ask: Do you recommend buying lady beetles and releasing them in your rose garden? No. Uh, it, it's a waste of money. Um, if you release your, uh, uh, again, uh, depends where you live, but even if even if you lived uh, anywhere in the country, I would not recommend uh, buying any beneficial insects. Um, uh, it's often the use of pesticides, especially insecticides, and you will, uh, and then uh, Put in uh, additional uh, perennials in your garden uh, that attract beneficial insects, and um, uh, you will find them. Uh, several. Uh, uh, I have um, 
I used to have um, uh, uh, the uh, brownies, the uh, Girl Scout brownies come into my yard uh, for various uh, workshops in the past. And um, one year they brought me uh, a bag of, um, of lady beetles and, uh, you know, as a, as a present. And of course, I kind of looked at him and I'm going, okay, what am I going to do with this? So I said, okay, well, let's make it into an educational uh, uh, experience. So I said, before we release them, I'm going to um, um, ask you to look for lady beetles in my, in my garden. So I took them in the backyard where I have a lot of uh, ornamentals and uh, perennials. And then I, you know, I showed him a few and we found five different species of lady beetles. Then I asked him, I said, okay, based on this, which, is the, which are the most common? So the most common at that time was the, um, the, um, uh, the uh, 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 Asian lady beetle, followed by the seven spotted lady beetle. And then after that, there was a little tiny beetle uh, called the, um, uh, blood red lady beetle, and then the, we found a couple other lady beetles. Um, the least common was the conversion lady beetle. And then I said, okay, now that we learn about the lady beetles, what kind of lady beetle do you have in your bag? And it was the conversion lady beetle. I said, okay, do you think I need any, any conversion lady beetles? And do you think they will stay in my garden? And basically, I, you know, we said no, because uh, uh, they will not stay in my garden. Um, but um, I told them, I said, if we're going to be using these lady beetles, let's, let's um, dunk them into uh, some sugar water. Um, um, that way, the sugar water will, will um, evaporate and it will, um, it will, uh, uh, um, uh, it will uh, uh, shut their wings so they don't fly away. And eventually they, they will fly, I mean, they will fly away eventually after they, they suck up, uh, the, um, they clear up the, um, the sugar water. But um, that's the only time I, I recommend them is if you're going to use them in your garden, uh, give them, uh, put, put, spray them with some sugar water or some seven up, you know, with uh, all the sugar so that um, they don't fly away. If you release them in your garden, I guarantee you that the following day, though all those lady beetles are going to be gone and you're going to be very disappointed that you lost all the money. All right, Mary McDonough would like to know, is it good after pruning roses to spray the winter heart oil as a preventative against many fungi and et cetera? Um, yes. I. I would uh, I would use uh, something like neem oil um, because it's uh, it has fungicidal action um, and um, and then it would also uh, it'll be uh, if you have any um, scale insects it will control those or if you have any other insects it will control those so yes. Next question, David. Davis would like to know, do you ever apply humid acid to your plants? No, I have, I'm not familiar with that, with that product. I heard about it uh, from Dr. Uh, Tommy, uh, Tommy Carnes, uh, but um, I thought that was in, uh, included in, uh, in pesticide, I mean, uh, fertilizers. So no, I don't uh, apply humid acid to my plants. I, uh, personally, I don't, Go for that. All right, uh, Steve Berry would like to know, what is your opinion on adding fertilizers to your sprays if diluted properly? Um, I would not recommend it. I, I would, um, um, I think that uh, if you're going to spray, spray for the right um, problem, uh, you know, either a fungicide or a uh, insecticide, but uh, um, apply the fertilizers separately. I would not, rec I would not recommend it. 
All right, Steve Barry would like to know what the difference between horticultural oil and neat oil, and what do you recommend for white fly on hibiscus plants? Okay, um, neem oil is um, is uh, an organic uh, in in uh, product uh, from the neem tree in India, and uh, the uh, horticultural oil is can, can be a, a synthetic product, um, either from uh, um, well, uh, at least the, if you're going to just call it uh, horticultural oil, it's going to be a synthetic product. Um, there are some, several types of oils out there. You know, it can be from um, um, uh, several mint plants. It can be jojoba. It can be uh, various types of oils. Um, uh, neem oil is, is, has proven very effective uh, for, um, for a lot of uh, sucking insects. And then on top of that, it has the fungicidal action. Um, so, um, if if I had the choice, I would go, I would go with neem oil because it's the organic uh, material. Um, uh, but again, I would be very careful how I use it, and I would definitely read the label on on its use. All right, we're down to last minute, so we have one more question. Those questions that are not answered by Bondo will be uh, answered later on and you'll get an email response. So Hank Rosen would like to know, what do you recommend for treatment of botrytis in Florida? Uh, for botrytis? Yes. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a toughie um, because botrytis is one of the, um, is one of the uh, fungi that loves the, uh, uh, cool wet weather and um, it uh, a lot of fun uh, you know there's also a lot of resistance uh, built in some of those uh, 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 um, in this fungus so um, I found that most fungicides are not that useful what I recommend what I recommend is the um, um, continue um, culture control such as um, removing uh, the flowers that start to show symptoms of botrytis. You know, when you start getting spotting, enjoy the flower for a couple of days, but as soon as you start seeing petals turning brown, then uh, take that, prune, prune out those, uh, those infected uh, stem, uh, uh, blooms, and you can just grab them by, with your hand and then just kind of, uh, you know, you're going to have a whole bunch of uh, petals in your hands. And then have a garbage bucket with you and then just toss them in the, in the trash can and then get them out of your yard as soon as possible. Do not, do not let that get it to the, to the uh, critical stage where the whole bloom is, is uh, gray. Uh, then you're asking for disaster. But no, I found the size are not that effective on uh, in in uh, garden roses. I would not recommend it. Thank you, Baldo. Before we close out, Gary, our executive director, John Corkin, has a few words he'd like to say to the attendees. John? Yes. First off, I'd like to remind every CR that we have a program next week. Uh, it'll be this same time. You'll be getting everyone that's on here. You will be getting an email uh, for chemical safety, and we invite you for that. Also, to my CR candidates, uh, I get emails talking about their certificate uh, where it will not pop up, and can I resend it to you? That is actually your pop-up blocker in your email. Uh, that controls that, and even if it's forwarded to me, I could not be able to send it back to you. Uh, I will be reaching out to go to webinar just to see if there's some trick that I do not know. I just wanted to let you know that I have noticed your emails on that, and uh, that seems to be the problem, uh, is the pop-up blocker uh, within your uh, computer. If you have any other questions, always feel free to reach out to me, but I just wanted to answer that question in bulk uh, since I've gotten a few emails. Do not worry, even though you do not have the certificate, we do have your name 
of everyone who attended today, you will get credit and that will go to your district CR chairs. So for sure that will happen even if we're not able to assist you in getting your pop-up blocker from bringing up that certificate. Just wanted to make that friendly reminder and thank you for attending and taking time out of your busy day today on Saturday. And we're so glad you're part of the American Rose Society. For you who are not, uh, we invite you to join the American Rose Society at www.rose.org. So you can get to some other webinars that we'll have that will be just for members, one of those member benefits. Thank you so much and have a wonderful weekend.